Aloha and welcome to Hawaii, the state of clean energy. I'm Mitch Yu and your host. Our sponsor is the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, a program funded by the Hawaii Natural and Energy Institute. I'm very pleased to welcome our guest, Professor Nicole Lautzi. Nicole co-founded and leads the University of Hawaii's Groundwater and Geothermal Resources Center. Today, Nicole is gonna tell us about the center's program and the good work the center is doing to identify Hawaii's water and geothermal energy resources, both of which we have a tremendous need for now and certainly in the future. Nicole will be discussing Hawaii's groundwater and geothermal resource limits and the need for a conscious drilling program. Nicole, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, I'm glad to be here. So Nicole, let's uh, start off by learning a little bit about you. So tell us a little bit about your background and hey, how you came to the University of Hawaii and why you founded the center. Sounds good. So um, I'm originally from the San Francisco Bay Area and left there before Silicon Valley took off. I went to UCLA for my undergraduate where I studied geology. So fundamentally, I consider myself a geologist. Um, after UCLA, I, I did a couple things different for a couple of years, and then I, I started a PhD program at UH Manoa. So that's what brought me to Hawaii. Um, for my PhD program, I studied active volcanoes in Italy, and it was kind of like why one volcano went boom versus bang at a different time. Um, it was exciting and fun. I left Hawaii for four years after completing my PhD and then returned um, on the last postdoc I had. I lived in Italy for 15 months and then Hawaii for nine months. And, and when that postdoc ended, I started working on a groundwater project and geothermal project. Um, and so I've been here since 2010. Consistently. So tell us a little bit about the center and let's pull up that first slide. Sure, the center um, was founded at a time I had a lot of students working on one of my projects and Don Thomas, who I work closely with, had a drilling project on Hawaii Island um, we had a lot going on and we were using things like a blogspot.com to post daily drilling updates. And so I was sending blogspot.com to colleagues and myself and the students said we should have our own kind of central hub to present information to the community and to the science, science colleagues. And um, really with no funding dedicated to forming a center or a website, we kind of pulled that together. Um, and yeah, it's, and there's a wealth of information on that website and, and we're pretty proud of it. So it launched, the website yeah. launched January 1, 2015. And how do we get to your website? I guess it's on the slide, right? <laughs> it's on slide one, I think. Yeah, so the website yeah. is higp.hawaii.edu slash hdgrc. It's great. So I've been to the website and it does have a wealth of information, so. So uh, let's uh, get educated a little bit on groundwater and on geothermal. So let's pull up the second slide and... Uh... Okay, so this uh, cartoon, we can call it, or schematic is from our DLNR's Commission Water Resource Management. And it shows the conceptual model for groundwater, fresh groundwater in, in Hawaii. Um, so you can see that the slide shows that there's fresh water, a lens of fresh water, which sits on our salt water, just ocean water. What's a, what's a lens? Tell us what a lens is. A lens is the shape. So it's kind of a, like a lens of a glass, glasses, right? So it's uh, a lens. And according to what's called the garvin herzberg principle, based on the density difference between fresh water and salt water, for every one foot or unit of measurement of fresh water above sea level, there'll be 40 feet below sea level. And um, as a result of that, and as this cartoon shows, the thought is that freshwater level above sea level does not increase much towards the interior of the island, unless it's trapped in impermeable rock, which in Hawaii we know to be dike material, or, or which is unerupted magma. So that same cartoon, if you want to go back to it for a second, shows where there's those vertical structures, those dike material, and the water is fresh water is at a higher level in the interior of the island. Um, in those locations. All, all over the earth, um, as you go into the earth, the temperature increases. Where geothermal and geo, potential geothermal resource exists is where that temperature gradient is accelerated. So instead of your typical geotherm or increase in temperature with depth, we have an accelerated 
increase in temperature with depth, which makes the heat accessible to us at the surface of the Earth um, and our drilling technologies. And so we know in Hawaii, because we have volcanoes, that where magma is erupted or magma is trapped in the subsurface, that there could be an elevated temperature gradient. And so what that slide shows is locations where deep wells have been drilled and um, the temperature gradient has been measured. So on the vertical axis is depth and on the horizontal axis is temperature. And you can see that there's very varying slopes of the lines that show um, different temperature gradients. And so what um, I can talk about where these wells are, if you'd like. Sure. Okay. So on the left side, the left uh, graphic shows wells that are not drilled along Kilauea's east rift zone. So Kilauea, we probably know, um, is the most active volcano in the state. And the east rift of Kilauea is what erupted in 2018 and has been the locus of eruptions in the state um, for the last, or for the volcano in the state for the last hundred or so years. So not in Kilauea, we don't see as high temperature gradients as we see drilling into Kilauea, which is what's shown on the right side on that slide. However, that one red shows an accelerated temperature gradient that was measured on Lanai. So that that is the first kind of elevated temperature gradient that we've seen off of Hawaii Island, which I think is significant in indicating the potential geothermal resource outside of Big Island. So uh, talk about the concept, the two, what I call a twofer. Like if I'm looking for water or whatever, I, I have like two major resources for the same cost. So comment on right. that if you would. Yeah, I mean, I like to point out that doing groundwater research and doing geothermal research are in some respects almost the same thing. Um, so we, Hawaii still has a lot to learn about its groundwater resources, which we'll probably get to. Um, and any research that we do for groundwater, we learn about geothermal and vice versa. Um, so the geothermal process is basically prospecting for water at an elevated temperature, but still requires understanding all elements of a groundwater system, like where the groundwater comes from, where it flows, if it's trapped within impermeable rocks, all of that information is important to understanding the geothermal resource and helps us understand our fresh groundwater resource as well. So just to uh, make sure everybody understands, groundwater is fresh water, the stuff we are able to drink and take showers with, correct? Correct, yeah. So other locations on the mainland have maybe surface water, um, lakes and streams. We don't have a whole lot of surface water in Hawaii because our lava flows, which are basically the carapace of our islands, are permeable. And so our rainwater trickles down into the island. Um, and so our, I think it's over 90% of our water that comes from our faucets and things is groundwater. So groundwater stored underground. So I understand you. We'll talk about your drilling program a little later in the show, but um, just at the top level, I understand that you've had a lot of surprises, good surprises in your drilling program, finding water, particularly in places where people thought we had no water. Do you care to comment on that? Yeah, every, so typically groundwater wells for, for production of water are drilled along the coast. And that's based on that Guyben Hertzberg freshwater lens model where um, basically less expensive to not have to drill um, very deep and then less expensive not to have to pump the water very far to reach the surface. And so because of that lens that you see there, um, it's just cheaper to drill water wells around the coast. Um, there have been four projects in this century, in the 21st century, um, that have drilled deeper wells to try and find water or to characterize the um, evolution and growth of Hawaiian volcanoes. Um, so these wells were drilled to 6,000 feet or deeper, and every single one of them kind of told us something entirely new about the groundwater system that's not consistent with the conceptual model that was shown on, on that first slide. So this is important because we're essentially running out of fresh water in Hawaii is my understanding, particularly uh, on leeward sides of uh, islands, like even the big islands got you know, droughts and, and uh, water issues. How do you care to comment on that? Well, I, yeah, I, it's just understanding our freshwater resource so that we can appropriately manage 
our fresh water, I think, is critical and will become increasingly more critical with climate change and the impacts of climate change. And so um, it's really been eye opening what we've learned from from the deep drilling projects that we've done, which indicates in most cases that we have more fresh water than we think. So what's the alternative? If we don't go out and find this fresh water, what, what do we have to do to, you know, if we start running out of water, what's the alternative? Well, reduce, reuse, recycle, or, or um, you know, desalinate our ocean water. But I have so, some good things to do would be to reduce water use, um, reuse water where possible, recycle water, um, and then, and then, yeah, find it, really figure out what our resource looks like and appropriately manage it. So finding it would be a lot cheaper than trying to desalinate salt water using very expensive electricity, correct? Correct, yep. So in the state of Hawaii, there's heat in the subsurface thanks to uh, the hotspot magnetism. And we know that the hotspot currently resides below Kilauea and Mauna Loa volcanoes on Hawaii Island and volcanism gets older to the Northwest. Um, so it's logical to consider it's going to be the hottest or highest temperature resources um, associated with, with Kilauea volcano. Data, though, it surprises a lot of people, but the data that we've collected indicates that there's likely a resource statewide, and we would need to do more of that drilling, the exploratory drilling, to figure that out, to really prove um, the presence of residual heat in the subsurface. Um, but if you bring that slide up again, I can talk about how how the geothermal resource produces electricity, and, and this kind of schematic that you see at the right here, that's specific to how the one geothermal plant in the state um, does it. There's variations to how the electricity is produced, but essentially we need a gas phase. And um, so typically there's a, a well that is drilled into the heat resource and either a steam phase forms or warm fluid is brought to the surface. Um, if there's a steam phase, which is the case for Pune Geothermal Venture, um, that steam can turn a turbine. And so, and that turbine translate kinetic energy to electricity, and, and that electricity goes out on the grid. The water is then cooled and condenses, but still hot. And so that hot water can be used to cause a gas phase to form in a liquid with a lower temperature, boiling temperature. So in that yellow whitish pipe, uh, is what's called a working fluid and the warm water that was brought to the surface then heats the working fluid to a gas phase and another burst of electricity is produced. The liquid that was brought to the surface is then re-injected into the subsurface so that we don't deplete the subsurface of uh, the groundwater resource and that's what warm up and then the cycle is con continuous. So essentially if you have a very hot well like they have at the PGV you get two shots at it Mm -hmm. The uh, steam phase and then the uh, working fluid phase. Um, resources with lower temperature that doesn't have a steam phase, you just get the uh, working fluid, like a organic Rankine cycle engine, which would produce uh, the electricity. And then, but you'd still re inject that hot water back into the, into the ground so that you preserve your, your water. You're not wasting water, just spewing it out, correct? Not wasting water. And typically that whole process where the water is hot is actually below the uh, drinking water table. So it's, it's a deeper process and there's actually no documented cases of any contamination of groundwater occurring in the United States from geothermal production. And, and what I just presented is, is called traditional geothermal. There's other technologies that are either under development or being talked about. Um, and those are typically where there's not a fluid in the subsurface. In Hawaii, we don't have to worry about that because we're in an island environment with the ocean water. It's infiltrated the island, so we have, we have water everywhere. Yeah, I'm fascinated by the fact that fresh water floats on top of seawater. Who would have thought, thought right. that, right? Uh, let's go to the next slide. And um, I want to talk about uh, land use and how uh, the efficiency of land use with geothermal versus other forms of energy. So can you talk to this one? Yeah, I um, didn't know a lot about geothermal when I started work on the projects maybe 10 years ago. And I've been really impressed about many aspects of geothermal, um, one of which is that its land use is the lowest footprint among renewables that are easily accessible to us, so like solar and wind. And that's what this slide shows. Um, there's in the top left there, there's a 33 megawatt geothermal plant 
and then you see the land occupied by a 26.4 megawatt solar plant. One really cool thing about geothermal is that it's base load or it's reliable. It's, it always can produce the same amount of energy or almost always. So it's capacity factor availability you see in that, that table is 90%, whereas solar is gonna fluctuate in time. And of course we get no solar energy at night. What this translates to basically is that you get more bang for your buck with the geothermal resource. So on 10% of the land occupied, you get four and a half times as much energy produced um, from the geothermal plant. That's true pretty much everywhere where there's solar resources and geothermal. And so I, I have another diagram like that for Hawaii comparing TGV's output to some of the larger solar um, farms that are going in. So I understand also uh, um, geothermal technology has progressed to the point where it, it's uh, pretty benign to the surrounding environment. Uh, you know, all, all the uh, effluents are pumped back into the ground, like you said, safely. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, that's that's true in Hawaii, and that's what we would do in Hawaii. I, I guess another benefit to geothermal that, for example, California is taking advantage of is, is a link to lithium. So what will happen when the, the liquid that comes to the surface cools some is some precipitate, some minerals might come out of that fluid that were dissolved in the fluid, and lithium is one of them. Um, but I, I just, I haven't heard any cases of anything negative associated with geothermal. Um, and let's start talking about your deep drilling program. What I have here is one, two, and three. These were all um, deep drilling pro projects executed by Don Thomas. And you can see your completed 2013, 2015, 2017. Again, they were funded for different purposes. One and two were funded to try and find water for the US Army on Pohakaloa training area, uh, where they were spending a whole lot of money or still are spending a whole lot of taxpayer dollars to bring fresh water to the center of the Big Island. So I should have pointed out on the, the image of Hawaii Island on the right and bring the side back, there's a purple and a blue star. And so those two are wells one and two, drilled to almost 6,000 feet and then 5,000 feet. So that's a, that's a significantly deep well. And what the first one found was instead of water at about sea level, which that conceptual model would have suggested, because we're not in a region where there's thought to be dike material, the water table was at 4,600 feet above sea level. So imagine that, like that's that's huge. Um, and, and so that was a, a big find for the army. If they produced that water locally, instead of trucking it to them, it would be reduced price and, and smaller environmental footprint, right? Also surprising about that well was at the base of it or the depth from below 3,000 feet, the water was, was fairly elevated temperature. So that was, also one of the first times, the first time, that elevated temperature was measured outside of Kilauea's East Drift Zone. Well, the I second well- they found a lot of water. It's not just a little bit of water. It was like a lot, a lot of water. Of water. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that's good for all of the island because that could be supplied to the uh, west coast, uh, the Kona side of uh, the big island, which is a big deal. Perhaps, yeah. It's, I mean, it's exciting for that general area, I think for the different yeah. landowners that wrap. So the geophysical data that we have for um, that region suggests that that fresh water would extend pretty extensively um, to the Northeast. And so um, it, it could be of, of interest to the landowners. So let's go to your next slide. So I'm, I'm in the process of wrapping up a five year long statewide resource assessment. The prior one was done 30 years earlier and published in 1985. and and both statewide resources assessment point to the probability of a geothermal resource existing on all islands in the state, not just Hawaii Island. So that, that's number one, and I think that surprises a lot of people. Um, despite this, there's still only one plant that produces electricity, and that's PGV. It's about where the yellow star is on the, the map of the Big Island to the right. And, and that one plant alone which occupies 45 acres of land, produces 30% of the Big Island's electricity, or did when it was active um, prior to the 2018 eruption of Kilauea. And then again, so then that Saddle Road well, the orange on this graph, is the only other location in the state where elevated temperatures have been measured until a couple years ago when we measured the elevated temperatures, but only to a depth of about 3,000 feet on Lanai. That's exciting, and otherwise we really don't know very much about the state's geothermal resource because we lack the drilling data. Our background gradient is pretty low because we have cold ocean water uh, in our island. And we don't see like, so I have blind there. There's not surface manifestations that show evidence of the subsurface heat, like hot springs or steam coming out of the ground, which occurs on the mainland. And our water table is pretty deep because again, we have permeable lava flows and the water, rainwater trickles down. 
and that translate to a, to a pretty deep water table, which makes our geothermal exploration expensive relative to other places in the world. Well, let's talk about expensive. So what do you mean by expensive? And, and if you had your druthers, I mean, if, you know, if you had the unlimited resources or some adequate resources, more adequate, more resources than you have now, what, what kind of a prospecting plan would you uh, recommend that we uh, put in place? Sure. Well, so everything in Hawaii is expensive, right? Our food's expensive, our electricity is expensive. And so similarly, when we have a deep resource, then, then we've got to drill pretty deep into um, the ground to try and access that temperature. And again, we learn about our groundwater too. I, I do want to point out, and we can show that at the end, that the drilling that I'm talking about doing has a very small footprint. So we're talking about drilling a like three inch diameter hole and we take the rock out of the ground to study the rock, but we want to get deep to see what's going on deeper below and to characterize both our groundwater and um, the temperatures. Uh, and so one deep well, one of those wells to say 5,000, 6,000 feet costs about two and a half to $3 million for UH to do the drilling. So, um, and talk about the UH drilling rig. If you yeah, the UH drill rig that, that is owned by UH right now is, is a coring rig different than a rotary drilling rig. So typically when somebody wants to drill a groundwater well or something, it's it's a rotary drill that breaks up the rock and turns up the rock as it drills down. The coring rig that we have is meant to preserve a rock core that can be studied. So we can study the minerals, we can understand the volcanoes. Um, and, and yeah, it's basically like it's a truck mounted rig, so it's it's small in that it's sm smaller than your average semi that you would see on a mainland highway, or I guess we have them on our highways too, but <laughs> as much as if you're taking a road trip. Um, and we have a picture of that too. Um, yeah, why don't you throw up that first slide and uh, I think it has a picture of what the drill rig looks like. There you go. Yeah, so this is a typical setup for one of our exploratory drilling projects. Um, that rig is the mast that's pointed up about, it's, I think it's 30 feet high. Um, it can lie flat too, and it's actually hidden behind that shipping container. So really, it's the drilling that I'm talking about, need, you need, we need about one or two acres of land, so not very much. Um, we need sh some containers that can hold our shipping supplies and then the rig itself. And it's a crew of about four people at a time when we're actively drilling. Um, so it's not, not a huge production. That's why I refer to it as conscious drilling in our uh, introduction to this. <laughs> So how, how long does it take to drill a well? Like, I know it depends on the depth, but, you know. Yeah, so, well, the drilling is actually the not time-consuming part. So we, of course, do all the environmental checks before executing a drilling project, and that's the most time-consuming part. And then act, making sure we have all the supplies to execute the drilling, because it's drilling days are really expensive, and so we don't want to have down days with a crew sitting around while the drilling project is going. So I would say start to finish for, like, a, a five to 6,000-foot well. Um, two to three years is what it takes us, but that's maybe six months of active drilling. So the, the drilling. So all the rest of it's permitting and all the other stuff we have, all the other hoops we have yeah. to jump through. Exactly. So, okay. So if I wanted to do a survey of all the islands, I mean, I don't want to do it one island at a time because say, well, what, three, three years times four or five islands. I mean, we're up to what, 15 years. Is, that's, that yeah. sounds like a long time to me. Yeah, well, and with predictions of climate change and how it's going to accelerate and take off, you know, I agree. We the, So the ambitious idea would be to have, you know, multiple drilling projects going on at the same time or as part of one co cohesive or comprehensive project. We could be um, looking at more than one island at a time, but we've really only ever done basically one hole at a time. So, you know, if I said... Uh, I give you five years. We can pretty well have a good idea of what each island, what kind of resources each island has. Correct? Is that is that a viable assumption? Well, so five years in each island would require something like probably twenty five, no, no, thirty million dollars, and we would need more than one rig. So we'd have to have multiple pro multiple drilling projects being executed at the same time. It, yeah, it's I'll doable. Work in parallel. Because we have a need for speed. We have to be in a little sense of urgency now. We need that fresh water and we need energy. We're going to get off fossil fuels. Like, mm -hmm. you know, the state set up this 100% by 2045. Uh, you know, we've picked a lot of low-hanging fruit, but, you know, to, to really get after it, we need some of these types of resources. And we're running out of water and uh, 
geothermal is a fairly um, economic uh, form of energy. Yeah, it, it is. It is one of the lowest cost renewable energies. It just has the highest upfront cost, which kind of has it, I suppose. But I, I mean, also this exploratory drilling is just the first step, right? And my opinion is getting the information about what, what the resource looks like across the state. And this is in terms of both groundwater and geothermal is, is a smart way to go about the process of moving towards more development. But of course the development is gonna be its own beast. Um, and that's whether it's development of production of groundwater or production of geothermal resources, but um, that's another five, 10 year process, right? So I, I think that moving on getting the data um, to understand how to most responsibly harness the resources is, I agree with you, basically, that it would be great to get moving. So let's just wind back a little bit to more and have a look at the budget. So, you know, if you were going to a money source, uh, spreading it out over a year, not just one great big lump, but so what would be a practical or reasonable kind of annual budget to really find out about our resources here in Hawaii? If we wanted to seriously take this on and do look at the entire state, um, I mean, a few millions a year would be viable, and then more when we're actually drilling. The drilling is the most expensive part, but I mean, we we spend three billion dollars a year importing fossil fuels, and I, I don't have an estimate of what groundwater costs are. But I mean, if we want to get into to money, you could be. The PGV pays royalties to the state. They've spent, paid $25 million in royalties to Hawaii um, since 2004. Solar has cost the state over $600 million in subsidies. Um, so millions of dollars is not big numbers for you know, understanding what a potentially large, powerful electrical resource um, indigenous production of electricity could be. Let's go on to the next slide. Thanks for that answer. Okay, here's something about money. So, um, and this this data come from the power supply improvement plan. The table is a little bit detailed to explain, but the bottom line from this analysis, and I've seen analyses that have geothermal coming out even more favorably, but geothermal costs less than solar and wind when you add 75% daily capacity storage to the intermittent renewables. So with geothermal, you don't need storage because it's always on. And, right. you know, so that geothermal, so, so solar and wind don't really provide for a resilient electricity supply. And that's why we need the fossil fuels, right? Because they are always there. Um, and that's why, in my opinion, geothermal has potential to replace the fossil fuels. And then the next point on that slide was that, again, the geothermal is a mineral resource in Hawaii and the state owns mineral resources. And therefore, that from the production of electricity, the developer has to pay royalties to the state. And those go to DLNR, Office of Hawaiian Affairs and Department of Hawaiian Homelands. So there's been about 25 million, as I said, in royalties paid from the production of geothermal since 2004, where solar is subsidizing the state's state solar subsidies have basically cost over $6 million dollars. $600 million, excuse me. And then again, we spent over $3 billion to pay for fossil fuel imports. So that's just so excellent. It sounds like geothermal and you get, it's a twofer. Don't forget, it's not just geothermal. And it's also that fresh water that we all need to live and grow our crops and all this other stuff. So it looks like it's a really good investment, a, a very good return on investment if, uh, if, we, if we allocate some resources to, uh, to your program. I well, let's uh, let's let's have some concluding. Uh, let's go to the conclusion slide because we're you know running uh, we're we're getting close to ending here. Talk about some conclusions that you have here. Okay, yeah, I mean, I typically start by saying you know we are as an island state, and I think we're one of the most isolated island states globally, island nations globally. Um, so we're really vulnerable to climate change being out here all by ourselves, and particularly in the context of freshwater and energy, and particularly given our reliance on imported fossil fuels. There are major outstanding questions with respect to groundwater, including where does groundwater come from, how does it flow, and as I pointed out, I think we know very little about the extent of the state. It's geothermal resource so again statewide. Again, I, I strongly believe in geothermal. It, it is the most reliable form of renewable energy with the smallest footprint, low hazards, and comparable, if not lower costs, than the intermittent renewables over time. If you look at the life cycle of a geothermal facility versus solar uh, and wind. We'll have to leave it there, Nicole. Uh, it's been really great having you on the show. Um, you've been watching Hawaii, the state of clean energy on Think Tech Hawaii. Today, we've been learning about the Hawaii Groundwater and Geothermal Resource Centers program and the need for a drilling program to define these resources. 
by the University of Hawaii under the leadership of Nicole Lautz. Thanks for participating, Nicole, and thanks to our viewers for tuning in. So I'm Mitch Yuan. We'll be back in two weeks with another edition of Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha.